Hebrews chapter 12. And in Hebrews chapter 12, it's a broad, kind of a broad scripture. It sounds like a healing scripture. It's really bigger than that. It's uh, Hebrews 12, 12 is where I'm going to start, and I want to read this to you. Therefore, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. Now, that's obviously using the picture of something physically weak, uh, feeble and weak, arms and knees, but this is bigger than that. And it says, make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. So... The end of this is healing and all kinds of healing, spiritual healing, physical healing, all kinds of healing. But to get there, I got to visit with you a little bit, all right? I got to visit with you on this a little bit and give you some background. I need to uh, give you some background. Before we get to the part where we're strengthening our feeble arms and weak knees, let's get some background. So uh, Hebrews, this area in Hebrews and Hebrews chapter 12, this whole area there, this is a situation where the writer is writing to a group of people who are facing uh, a pretty good, uh, they got a pretty good idea that they are facing some persecution that's coming. And it looks like it's, it's, it's not going to be fun. You know, it's not going to be good. It looks pretty bad. And some of them are concerned that maybe their property will be confiscated or, you know, they don't know what kind. Is it going to be, uh, you know, torture? Is it going to be death? Is it just going to be, uh, they're not going to allow us to work. They're going to seize our property. They don't know. They just know that the season of persecution seems to be coming and they're what what do you think you think they're a little nervous think they're a little scared think they're a little trembling not knowing what to do so the writer of hebrews here is trying to encourage them to not back down to to not be to, 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 to not let to not let your arms and your knees give out and so through this chapter 12 it's kind of given us some reasons why so you back up verse 3 and it says consider him who endured such opposition. And we know who that him is, right? Jesus. Consider Jesus who endured opposition. Now notice what it says, from sinful men, so that you may not grow weary and lose heart. So the first thing is you have to understand that we got to consider Jesus. He's been through it. Now I want to say something to you about persecution though before we get there, all right? This is persecution that is happening because they are doing something right. If you have a bunch of people after you because you've been a jerk, that's not persecution. You've been crabby, cranky, hard to get along with, wanting your way, and people in the church don't want to sit by you. Don't send a letter to us saying, pray for me, I'm being persecuted. No, you're just reaping what you sowed. You ought to be getting that. If nobody wants to be around you, there's a reason. This is persecution, suffering because you want to do what's right. You want to have a move of God. You want to stand up for what this is. This is saying, don't back down from what's right. Today, we're so full of people backing down. Every, everywhere I go, Christianity's backing down. Oh, I know, it might not look like it because sometimes, you know, you see, the, we're, uh, you see you get a thing about... Uh, you know, we're going to march here and we're going to hire, you know, we're going to vote for this politician who's a believer or something like that. I'm not talking about out there in the political arena. I, I'm talking about the backing down from the pulpit arena. Backing down. Every, there's, there's thousands and thousands of these young guys that have learned from a bunch of old coots how to not get God in church. How to get God not to attend your church. And all they're doing is backing us down. They're giving us less. They're advertising. Can you believe it? They advertise less church. Less church. I got an ad the other day. It said, and, and their, whole, their, their whole ad was, come here. There's less church. And so, like, I'm saying, well, then, God, if I go to that church, guess what I'm going to say? Less church, less money. That's what I'm going to say. Less money. Just go in there and say, you're going to cut half church. Then how about you go to half pay, lazy? Hey, why don't we start paying these preachers by the hour? I guarantee you, they're not going to have less church. Right? Some of them, some of them, their sermons are such sermonettes, we need to pay them by the minute. Because that's all we're getting is some minutes. Right? <laughs> so, that's my point here. 
If you're being, you know, if, if somebody in your church is saying, we need more of God, if they're saying, we need to have more of God, we need to have the spirit of revival, we need to have some fire in our churches, then you're not being persecuted. You're, you're not doing what's right. You can only be persecuted because you're standing for righteousness. Persecution and standing for righteousness go together. You can't be persecuted because you're hard to get along with. But I've had people say it, pray for me, I'm being persecuted, and then you realize it's a, it's, you're just being hard to get along with, you're just not being a very good person. So understand, these people are doing what's right. God is showing up in their services. God is moving among the people, and now persecution is kicking up its heels. Persecution is kicking up its heels. And so now, what are they gonna do? Well, this says, consider Jesus, consider him, that he endured opposition. He endured the opposition. Listen, you want to have a move of God, you want to have revival, I'll guarantee you, you're going to have some opposition. You're going to have it. It's already there. It just, it just, you just don't notice it. If, God, if you don't have a move of God, then the opposition just sits quiet and blends in. I mean, you know, People tell me, they think their church has unity. And I said, yeah, you got unity because you're all a bunch of backsliders. No wonder you all get along. You're all backslidden. When everybody's backslidden, of course you're all getting along. But when God begins to show up and there's people that begin to have prayer meetings every week saying, we're not going to quit praying until God shows up at our church, you're going to find out there are some people that are going to be part of the opposition. And here it says you need to learn to endure it and so you don't grow weary and lose heart. But this is the part I like about it. Endure, Jesus endured opposition from sinful men. We got to let that soak in. I have people, I have, the, the, have you ever heard this one? Like, like my church, why, they're all good Christians. They just don't want revival. I go, what? If they don't want the spirit of God to move in their church, they're not good. That is not good. They're not good. Don't tell me they're a bunch of good Christians who are now shutting down so God can't move. They're stuck 150, 500 years in history with that and they won't let God live today through the church. They don't believe. They're full of unbelief. Nothing's happening. God's not attending. And you're going to tell me they're good Christians? Don't pull that on me. People who oppose the move of God are sinful. Jesus was opposed by sinful men, not good Jews who just misunderstood him. And so, I can tell you this, every time God wants to move in a church and somebody starts opposing it, I'll guarantee you there's sin there somewhere. I'll guarantee you. Now it's hidden, it's covered up. Somebody's trying to protect their sin from the Spirit of God coming and changing it. Did you hear me? Opposition doesn't come from good people. It might come from good people who look like good people, but I'm telling you, there's sin somewhere. Anybody that goes to church every week and starts opposing God every week has got something wrong with them and they're hiding something. Because the rest of us, we want God to come down. We want him to come close. We're not trying to get God to go someplace else. We want him to come here. So, here we have that. So he says, consider him who endured opposition. And I know there's a lot of people watching. And uh, that's why I'd love to make the con that call-in connection with you. Just call in and say, pray for my church. We're believing for revival. That's a great connection there. But I know there's a lot of people, we sometimes forget that. They're, they're, they are up against opposition in their churches, in their communities. All they want is a church where God's active. <laughs> You know, spontaneous, I mean, like Bible stuff. They just want some Bible activity. You know, people being transformed and being changed and delivered and healed. And when a, and, 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 you know, when a marriage is struggling, at least we have the hope that we know that they're standing, those two people are standing in the presence of God. At least there's a chance that their hearts could break. You know, just a chance that their hearts could break, that their marriage could be adjusted, that they could be standing there and go, whoa, what an idiot I am. I mean, a lot of times, that'll heal a marriage right there, won't it? Just one, one old guy standing here in the presence of God saying, 
boy, am I an idiot. Now, just try telling him he's an idiot. Uh Uh-oh, that's going to bring another marriage fight. So you can't tell your husband he's an idiot and get your marriage put back together, can you? But the Holy Spirit can do it. He can be standing here, and he hears from heaven, you are an idiot. And he goes, you know what? I'm an idiot. And, and then what's he do? He turns to his wife and says, well, you forgive me. I've been an idiot. And now we got some healing going on. It happens here all the time. All the time it happens here. Uh, and it's not just the guys. It just sounded like it was just the guys. But So sinful men consider Jesus. There's opposition, and I know you face it but we've got to endure it because it's right. Revival is right. And understand, these are not a bunch of good people trying to stop you. Because sometimes that can be confusing, like, well, maybe they're good people and I'm off. No, sinful people are opposing what God wants to do in your church and in your, in your community. So we gotta consider Jesus. He endured it. And, you know, um, here's another, as you keep reading this, there's another reason in here that you need to endure. And that is, it says, because when this happens, and opposition comes, you should look at it as coming as discipline because God is treating you as a son. So one reason to do it is because if you endure it, then you, can, you won't grow weary and lose heart. And the second thing is, you're being treated like a child. You say, how does this work? Because I, I don't know how you think about it. Like with me, like here's what I wanna say. Like God, if I'm, if I'm your son and they're opposing me and hurting me and threatening me, then you should go do something to them, get rid of them and stop this nonsense. Protect me. But God doesn't. He lets, did you notice? Through history, God has allowed persecution. Now, that's hard to figure. That's hard to figure. Until you realize that Jesus had to endure opposition, and I can never talk to him face to face if I've never endured it. If I have to be sheltered from everything that he endured, then how can I be like him? How can I talk like him? This puts you in a class all by yourself. This puts you in kind of the the Jesus class of person because not very many people will endure opposition. Most of them are gonna cave in. What's the Bible say? Remember the Bible says that he who sows, remember that? And because of uh, uh, persecution comes on account of the word, persecution comes on account of the word, what happens to them? They fall away. Most people fall away. Most people give up. Most people are gonna cave in. If you endure it for righteousness sake, Wow, God, I mean, we'd rather God just take it away, but God says, but what if I don't take it away? What if I don't take it away? What if you endure it? You have put yourself in a class of people that are rare on the face of the earth. You endured opposition that was not popular for the sake of righteousness, and you're still here preaching, singing, worshiping. I'm telling you, there's not very many people like that on the entire face of the earth except people like Jesus. I'm telling you, you're in a class. You have selected a priority that few people will ever select in their life. And God gives every single one of us a chance to step into that class of person. Gives everyone. Instead of taking it away, he says, I got a better deal. Consider Jesus. He endured. You endure. You stand up for right when your friends, your community, your relatives, your denomination. Had to throw that one in. And and you know how they're gonna treat you, but you also know in your heart that a move of God that saves people, heals, puts this thing back together, takes away our dysfunction, you know it's right. You know that God coming down with some flames of fire in our services, you know that's right. But you, oh, but might be those people oppose you, right? So a little chicken hearted, He's just gonna take the paycheck and go home, huh? No, 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 no. You put yourself in the class. You have an opportunity. You have an opportunity to set a priority that is historical. An historical priority that in the face of opposition, you're going to endure and continue to preach righteousness, continue to stand up for the things that are right and not back down. I'm telling you, you put yourself in a class with Jesus and, you, and, and God didn't have, imagine that, God didn't have to take it away from you. You're gonna press on. God just treated you like a son. 
He treated you like a daughter because he didn't take it away from his son. He let his son step into a class of human and God, right? A class of person that the world has never seen before. And you can step in that with him. Or you can back down. You can back down and, you know, just be slime the rest of your life, you know? And you're slime and everybody else. You know what I'm saying? Or you can stand and keep on standing. So that's part of it. First of all, so you won't grow weary and lose heart. But second of all, so you can step into the class of a son and daughter and live, live like it. Jesus went through it. You go through it. He stood up for what's right. You stand up for what's right. He set a value on it. He said, this is more valuable than my life. And you set a value on it and say, this is more valuable than my life. You are a rare person if you can do that. Now, some of you are not on the national, international level with your ministry, but you know, sometimes it's hard just your own friends are saying back down. Your relatives, you might be married to somebody saying back down, you know? So it's a battle. If you're trying to do really what's right, you always find those, those, uh, those people that really, and, and you know, it's really, you know, it says sinful men, but I can tell you what you're always up against. When you wanna have a move of God, you're always up against the same old thing, right? Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You've heard of those things? It's one of those. Somebody in there has got one of them, and they're protecting it, and they're afraid of the move, move of God. You know, the funny thing about it is, we love, you know here, we love to invite you to come to World Revival Church. We overdo it, I know. We always are saying it. And, and people come up from other parts of the world, and they tell you to come, like we're paying them to tell you or something, you know? But... It's just you get here and God is so good that you want, I mean, it's natural to want everybody to experience it. But the problem with it is, that I have with it is, if you're dealing with people who are in the pride of life, they're already in pride, then, me, then, then the next person that gets up here and says, I just got here, my life has changed, you need to come to World Revival Church. What did we do? We just sunk their ship even more. Now they're burning up more. There's another one saying, I gotta go there. If you're in the pride, if you're in the lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, or the pride of life, every time we say come to Kansas City, you get worse. Because you're sick, see, on this stuff. And you get worse. And so we innocently keep saying, come to Kansas City, come to Kansas City, and not realizing there's people just, they just, it just turning up the fire underneath the kettle for them. More steam, more steam, more steam. Because their pride says, I don't want to hear about another place. I don't want to hear about another ministry. I don't want to hear about another place or ministry or anything like that. I want it all. I got it. I, I want to have people, you know. Listen, you can have it all. You just got to pay the same price we did. You just got to face the opposition, start preaching the truth, stand up for righteousness, and then you can have it all. Next thing you know, maybe you'll be on TV. Maybe somebody will come and hear you preach. You can do it. You can, you can do it, but don't get mad at others and become part of the opposition of sinful men because you haven't had the courage to stand up for what the Spirit of the Lord is telling you to do. So you gotta set a priority. You gotta endure. You gotta be willing to be treated as a child of God in the class, not as Jesus, not to say we are as, you know, like, just like Jesus. I don't wanna outclass him. You can't anyway, but the class of him like a child and like that and endure it. So, and, and now there's, there's another reason. You wanna know the other one? Here it is, the other says, and also you need to do it so you can share in and participate in his holiness. Uh, this is verse 10 up there. Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we might share in his holiness. And what, what is the discipline he's talking about here? The opposition, right? Oh, just take it in context. Don't make it something it's not. The opposition is part. He says, endure it as a child. Endure it as discipline because it's putting you in the class of Jesus. He had to endure it. Plus, it also helps you share in his holiness. Now, holiness, what does that mean? You know, there's a word that's kind of been lost. I lost it too. I'm trying to get it back. I remember growing up and hearing the word sacred. Remember we had sacred music? And that kind of got so old fashioned. That, but I, I had to relearn that s s God appreciates sacred. And I understand it now. Because if you put it sacred into the category of holiness, holiness means to be set apart. 
And set apart means you call something sacred. But I'm really up in the thick of this because everywhere I go, everybody's trying to make religion common. They're trying to make everything so common, nothing sacred anymore. They don't want something set apart holy anymore. We want to mix and match it. In other words, we, we, we're feeling like we're going, to do, we're going to do you all a favor. We're going to do this. What I want you to do next, we just bring your lattes in. Bring your latte, bring your coffee, bring your, and sit in here and just, we're going to show you that how common this is. And the second you start making God and his things common, he leaves. He's not common. He's holy. He's separate. He says, I need you to be holy. That means you separate time. You separate events. You separate music. You separate a place where it's not like any other place. If it's like every other place, it can't be holy. If every service here is like every place else we go, it can't be holy. There's got to be something sacred, set apart, things that only happen here that can't happen any place else because everything's so mixed up and matched up and everything. But here, we're going we're gonna to separate ourselves ourselves unto the Lord. And so we're going to separate our thoughts. We're going to separate our activities. We're not going to bring everything. We're, we're not here to make you comfortable. We're here to make him comfortable. <laughs> you at home better write that down, put it on your refrigerator. You know, it may be a long time before you find another preacher willing to just tell you that. That's why we like you to call in, because when you call in, we know that you're kind of matching heart to heart. That, that tells me you're getting it. When I hear how all these people, thousands of people called in, I say, hey, some people got this, got this. It's just a whole other way to think. Loving God, enduring, it's worth it. Setting a priority. All these things, and, and then being set apart not trying to make everything common. And that's what, have you ever noticed? That's why I mean, oh, now I'm getting off on it again. But all this advertising I see about churches, everything is telling me, come to my church, it's common. Common. You know, come with your little flippy floppies and whatever, and bring your, and, you know. And, and we're going we're gonna to just lower this down to where it's common. Now, I know dressing up doesn't, make it anything i know all that kind of stuff but it does if you don't normally ever dress up it'd be nice to set apart a week and just put on something good for him i mean if you do it for your girlfriend you ought to do it for jesus if you do it for your boy if you comb your hair for some guy in town you know who could care less about god you ought to at least try to fix yourself up a little bit for church just so you can show a little holiness Say, I'm a slob the rest of the week, but when I come to church, I set myself apart and I look different. All kinds of ways. But we're trying to make it so common now. It's lowering it down and common. I said that we, we think the people will come. But yeah, but God won't come. God won't come. He's holy. He says he's holy. He's not going to mix and match with every little spirit and every little attitude and every little idea of the world, even if you do bring it to church. He's holy. He's set apart. He doesn't mix and match. Once you learn that, then you need to do this. And so when we find opposition, then we endure it. We say this is like discipline. God's disciplining me to walk in the same power and the same priority and value system that Jesus walked in. And so now we're gonna set ourselves apart and know that, that this, is, this is worth it. And so anyway, you know, for you at least, you call this valuable. You call this valuable. Some of you watching at home, what you see here, you call it valuable. Other people may call it foolishness or wasteful, but you call it valuable. Then you're, you're setting a priority. You're setting a priority. Something's valuable. All right, now we get down to this part about um, all that. So consider Jesus treating you like a son. Walk in his holiness. You've got to have some separateness, set-apartness about you. For, you know, God is holy, and you can't change it. So you can mix and match it all you want, but he, like I said, he won't be there. And then 
Then, after we do all that, it says, therefore, because what I just told you, strengthen your feeble arms and weak knees. And it's like this. You know, when Abraham caught how old, you know, Abraham got a revelation of how old he was and what a big miracle this is going to be. The Bible says he was strengthened in his faith, not weakening. He didn't weaken in his faith. He was strengthened in his faith. Most of us, the only way we get strengthened in our faith is if nobody tells us, right? If nobody tells us, we just want to live with blinders on. But not God, and Jesus didn't, and Abraham didn't, and Paul didn't. They, go, they know what, we know what, op- we know what we're up against. We know what the opposition is. We know who it is, what it is, and how it works. And we do this anyway. We're not blinded like we have no idea what's going on. We know what's going on. And do you know what I, if you'll listen carefully, do you hear what I hear when I say some of the stuff I say about religious people? It's like rumblings in the heaven. I'm telling you, the demons just begin to tremble. And they, they hate it and it just shimmers and shakes above us when I come against all the things that's keeping you from becoming the spiritual giant that you could become, filled with the Spirit, walking in signs and wonders and miracles, being the light of the world, the salt of the earth, with a priority enduring all circumstances that come up to oppose you. That's who you really are. You just don't know it because you've been made so common. You've been made like a commoner instead of child of God that you are. And so here, as we look at this, then we, you know, make the paths straight, get those hands, get them, get them so they're healed again. And then it says this line, make level paths for your feet. Now, for me, if I just read it on the surface, it sounds like I should just get every obstacle out of the way. But it's bigger than that. It actually means when you make a level path, it, this translates out to mean you set and fix your eyes, you set a goal, and then you go for it. And that's why you can become a different kind of person because this is saying, make level paths for your feet. Set a goal, you know what's right, go for it, no matter the opposition, no matter what comes against you, do this, and don't get distracted. You know, everybody sitting here, everybody watching, there's, only, there's really only one thing that can defeat you, and that is distractions. I mean, you read about, you know, the devil's defeated, the blood of the lamb, we've got the Holy Spirit, salvation, we have the promise of heaven, you know, we, all these great things in the Bible, but why do they not work for people? Because everybody's so distracted. This says set a path, make a path, set a goal, and don't let your, yourself be distracted. And when you read it in context, guess what that means? That means that every time you face opposition, it's not really opposition. It's just a distraction. It's a distraction. Think of it that way. Every time you're trying to go for the goal of God that God has for your life, isn't it amazing how a distraction comes? And people rise up and they oppose you and they say bad things about you or they try to stop you or whatever. Well, those are the church folks at least. That's what they do. You know, well, they, they got to throw in a little gossip and backbiting too, you know. And they do all that stuff because you're trying to really have a move of God in your church. And, you know, you, some of you sitting here might think I'm exaggerating, but those people at home around the world, they know I'm not exaggerating. Some of these people are being mistreated and abused and treated terrible simply because they want a move of God in their church. The world is not worthy of them. Some of these preachers that are preaching and getting no support and getting persecuted and made fun of that tune in every Friday night to Daystar because they have no hope, they have no spirit, they have nothing to bind to, and they don't even, because their church is floundering, they don't even have the money to get here, but every Friday night they tune in to get some life because this is all they've got. The world is not worthy of those preachers who continue to preach the truth all by themselves, no money, no crowds, no support, no applause, but they continue to do what's right. The world is not worthy of you, sir. The world is not worthy of you, man, for preaching like you do in spite of the opposition. People who, they get opposed. 
but they keep going knowing that the opposition, it's just a distraction. You know, people who are spiritual, this is how they look at the world. There's Jesus and everything else is just a distraction. There's Jesus, his people, and his kingdom. Jesus, his church, his kingdom, there's Jesus, and then there's everything else. That's a distraction. Everything else is just to keep me distracted from him, his kingdom, and his ways. I'm telling you, this is, this is helping us understand what the calling on our lives is. Yeah, there's gonna be distractions. There's gonna be opposition. There's gonna be circumstances, but you have to do what's right. And so you set the goal. And once you do, here's what Kathy and I did and some others here have done. We set the goal of what we wanted to do with our lives years ago. And then all the events that happened between then and now were just distractions. But we had already decided where we were going, so it didn't matter. It didn't matter how many mountains we had to climb, how many valleys we had to go through, how many difficult things, how many diseases we had to defeat, how much gossip we had to hear about ourselves. I mean, it was irrelevant because we'd already said we're going from here to there. We're going for revival. We're gonna have a church where God moves. We're gonna have a worshiping church. We're gonna have people around us that love God and we're gonna raise up people that love God and can take this to the nations. We're gonna do that. We're gonna to touch the world with our lives. Anything between here and there is just a distraction. You can do the same thing. If you can be undistracted and set your priority, then you can walk this thing out and set yourself in a separate class of people like the world has never seen before. Well, as you read all this, it gets down, all this is good stuff, but did you know the last promise in this is not about you and not for you? If I were to ask for a show of hands here or whoever is watching, wherever, if you know you, 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 know, you got people, how about this, you know, if I were to ask you, do you have people in your life you'd like to see them come to God, get saved? You know, you'd love to see them come to church. You know, everybody here would have hands up and, you know, if we were saying, would you like to see a great awakening hit your nation, our nation, or some other nation? Would you like to see a great awakening of the salvation of God and, and the move of God and everybody's getting saved? And everybody say, yeah, 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 we want it. And uh, yet, how do you get it? How do you get it? I'm gonna just toy with you a little bit and guess, I'll just take a wild guess, that if I were to ask you how to get everybody saved that you wanna get saved, you probably are not gonna come up with the right answer. Because, listen, don't we have a lot of evangelists? We got all kinds of Christian radio, Christian TV, T-shirts, jewelry, music. We got everything. And yet, statistics say that the church is not growing. As many as come to the Lord, die and go to the Lord. And so we're not really growing as an army that much. It looks like we are, but statistics say the church is not growing worldwide at all. So what could really set a great awakening? Wouldn't you like to know? Well, it's right here, yeah. Just, most people aren't gonna do it. But let's find out what would do it. Make level paths for your feet so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather healed. You see, the last part of this is, uh, it's not for yourself. This is telling you what staying on course will do. This is telling you, staying on course. If every believer who's been called of God to a course, to a path, would stay on their path, we'd find out that those who are lame would not be disabled, but they would be healed. Now, I'm gonna take that, I'm gonna just take it literally, because I know there's a lot of sick people watching. There could be some even here. So I wanna take that literally. But, but it, it also, and probably wider, means the disabled and the lame are not just people who are physically sick, but this is the spiritually sick church, and I'm telling you, we got a lot of lame religion around, don't we? Man, is it lame. Wow, you don't even have to go to church to find out it's lame, just go ask a bunch of people why they don't go to church. There's a cause, it was boring, it was lame, it was hypocritical did nothing for me. We've got lame religion on our hands. Well, how are we gonna get over it? How are we gonna get past it? How are we gonna get this disabled church, disabled religion, disabled Christianity, how are we gonna get it healed? And here, the writer of Hebrews is telling us, this is the way you do it. You stay on your course. If those who can will, 
and that's, I'm one of them. If those who can, will, continue to walk this path without distractions, the lame will follow. See, the spiritually lame are gonna follow something, somebody. They're all followers. They're all followers. And the reason they're not following us is because we're becoming like them. We're making it common, we're lowering it down, we're lowering the bar, we're not having anything, and so all of a sudden, you go and you sit in church and you look around and everybody's as lame as you are. Their marriages, their hearts, their hearts are hurting, their marriages, they're dysfunctional, they're depressed, they're upset, they need support, they need a friend. All they wanna do is get a cup of coffee and talk and talk and talk about all their problems and be, go into the pastor's office and get themselves analyzed so they can figure out why they're being like, the, it's just, you know, why don't we just get healed? Well, this says, if those who can, will, without distraction, continue to walk the calling on your life, if you will walk out the calling, the level of calling, the level of calling. I mean, you might be a pastor, that doesn't mean you're up to the level of your calling. You know, if you will live up to the level of your calling, this says what? The lame will follow and what will happen? And they will be healed of their lameness because we've given them something to follow, something to get in line. But if all of us start backing down, the lame have no place to go and nobody to follow, and they start falling into the pit. The answer to global revival, the answer to global awakening to people, millions coming to Jesus, is not some supernatural thing where the sky opens and something falls out and everybody wants to get saved. No, it's when the people of God begin to walk the path that God has given them, the rest of the world will follow and they will find Jesus. They will find Jesus so that the lame may not be disabled, but rather they can be healed by giving them an uncompromised, not backing down against all opposition, not distracted, following the path that God gave us. We can get people saved. We can have a global awakening if the people of God will wake up and be revived. That's what I believe. That's what I believe. It's that hard and it's that simple. That's what I believe. It all comes back on the people of God walking as the people of God and we can evangelize the world. That's all it takes. And every person comes on board, consider Jesus. He endured all opposition. He didn't get weary. He didn't lose heart. He kept going into the path. You do the same and we can have global revival and a great awakening. I wanna pray for you right now, for your calling, for your life, for those listening around the world that you know you're not living for God. You're so distracted, 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 distracted. The only way Kathy and I have been able to keep doing what we do is to not be distracted because nothing else is more important than what we do. This is the calling of God on my life, on your life, on our lives. Is there anything more important? When this life is over and you stand before him, are you gonna make excuses? You're gonna make excuses? Or are you gonna run the path? You're gonna finish the race? You're gonna finish the course that has been picked out? Everybody here, you got a course for your life. You need to set the end goal and then everything in between is irrelevant. It doesn't matter what, how much, it doesn't matter what's between here and there. You gotta go there. You gotta finish this race the way God told you to do it. Everything else is just a distraction. Pray with me now and say, Dear Jesus, I wanna finish my race. I believe you're the savior of the world who died for my sins, rose again from the dead as my example of endurance, of priority, and of love for God. I want to follow you all the days of my life and never change my mind. So from this moment on, I am yours. And I'm never gonna change my mind. And 
I'm never backing down. Kathy, come on, let's pick out some more names yeah. and pray over some people. Pearl Elizabeth in Pearland, Texas, needing healing of her hip and her back. Conchita in Imperial, Missouri. She's having trouble. She's needing to be on oxygen. She needs a miracle to be able to breathe. For Ildi in Indianapolis, Indiana, for the power of God's glory and revival to fill her and her life. Marine in Shreveport, Louisiana, health problems. Joni in Robertsdale, Alabama, believing for her daughter, Madeline. She needs help with a lazy eye, and there's blindness in that eye. For Gloria in Jamaica, New York, dealing with breast cancer. In the name of Jesus now, we lift these names to the throne of grace tonight. We speak that virtue, we speak healing, we speak the breath of God, the wind of the spirit of life right now, in Jesus' mighty name, and we say, be healed, be healed, be healed in Jesus' name, for Anne in Crestview, Florida. For Heather in Youngstown, Florida, with a tumor on her spine. I hope you all don't mind when I name these things specifically because we've learned around here, we just don't want to say, oh, God love her, God bless her. We want to be, we want to pinpoint our faith and we want to shoot those arrows of divine healing right at the real need. For Peggy in Russellville, Arizona, dealing with depression and anxiety, and Tori in Shawnee Mission, Kansas, needing a normal delivery, expecting a baby soon. Ruby in Ferndale, Michigan, arthritis in the neck. Dana in Altoona, Alabama, addiction. The Jasmine in Pensacola, Florida, salvation and healing. Margaret in Washington, healing for her husband, Pablo, and Darlene in Dallas. We believe right now for the miracle working power of God. I called your name, you heard your name called. You need to rise up right now. You need to touch that TV screen, just like Heather urged everybody to do. You need to do something by faith right now as we release, we release the word of God and the word of faith and we say, be made whole in Jesus' mighty name. Now, what do you think, Kathy? You think, yes, was sir. I too tough tonight? What do you think? I loved it. It's kind of tough. I wasn't very funny either. I should have cracked a few more jokes to ease the pain. But you were right. You were saying things that can bring hope and help. And if there's some humble leaders out there who are, who are frustrated, Although that, they can hear that and they can respond. And it can be the, the clue they're looking for. Being filled with the latte, that's kind of funny. Everybody well, I kind of laughed at that. Yeah, being filled with the latte instead of the power that's, of the Holy Spirit. Huh? We don't want that. So there was a few moments. There were a few humorous moments, honey. But I think they got it. I told the truth, didn't I? You that's told all the I truth. And Everything God, I said was yeah, true. And God will back you up. Yeah, it's just the Bible, eh? Well, that's uh, how we've learned to live. Tell the and truth. And I think, I think some people here have got it, too. I think you know you have been living with distractions. You could, you could change the world if you could stop being distracted. Yeah, in the name of Jesus Christ.
We can bring a great awakening to the world if we stop being distracted by the world. Come on, prayer warriors, join me. There's a great spirit here of receiving. You can see I've already been through here, so let's go out to that other line. Now, in the name of Jesus, come on. No more distractions. Touch us, God. We want to change the world. We want to change the world. By not being distracted by the world. All opposition is just a distraction. The world wants your attention and you can't give it to them. Yeah. 